I'm reading from the King James Version. All right. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and when were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So the first, the, the past couple of weeks I have been trying to get to these scriptures and I just not have been as successful because the Lord has led us in a different way. And really what I felt like God was breaking up the fallow ground or breaking up the hardened ground of our hearts. In order for us to plant something right, in order for you to plant something and you want to get the growth that comes with planting there, you need to break up the hard ground. You got to get a good soil. Amen. I believe the past couple of weeks, hopefully, God has done that. Hopefully, that the Spirit of God has really cultivated our spirit, our heart, and we are now able to hear God's Word. Is that good? Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. So today, I want to really begin to talk to us about what this Rooted series is all about. Amen. And we're, we're going to pray, and it's based on Hebrews chapter 6. So let's pray. Father... We thank you, God, for your wonder-working power. We thank you for your love and your kindness to us. I thank you, God, for every heart that is open, every ear that will hear what you, your spirit says to us. I pray, O oh God, that you will just help me as I speak your word. I pray, O oh God, that at, when, at the end of the service, we'll be different than when we came in. And we're going to give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you say amen? Amen. amen. may be seated. God bless you. Thank you for standing so long. Uh, for those of you that are here for the very first time, we're so glad that you're here. Amen. God bless you. For those of you here that we haven't seen in a while, amen. God, God bless you. Thank you for um, being here. Amen. And um, so <clears throat> the past couple of weeks has just been tremendous um, move of the Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Um, according to his word and we've talked about being rooted being established being settled being not moved we talked about being anchored in 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 the word of god and because when we're anchored in christ when we're anchored in the word of god then we could definitely run nobody that 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 does not have an anchor amen no one no ship that does not have an anchor is a safe ship it is bound to float around. It's bound to smash around wherever it is that the wind blows it or whatever or the wind um, blows it right and the waves toss it. It'll just go back and forth. But a person that is anchored in the word of God, anchored, uh, let's, let's look at it even from a, from a standpoint outside of the scripture. Anybody that's anchored in something, you can trust on them because they're not moving we, we talked about the fact that you need to be rooted in order for you to grow right we say you can't grow up if you're not rooted down all right so i wanted to to speak really on these topics that are presented here by the apostle paul uh, from the book of hebrews chapter six now mind you it's going to sound a little bit more didactic it's going to sound a little bit more teaching than, than, than we're normally accustomed to here at Worship and Praise Community Church. Amen. We like to hear the inspirational preaching. Um, and, and this is a little bit different. It's a little bit more uh, it, deeper. And, and so I need everybody to drink their Red Bull before you get here, okay? Sometimes, sometimes we get really falling asleep. I look across the, I look across the crowd, and, and people are like halfway sleeping, sideways. Amen. If you see somebody sleeping, you have a right to put your uh, phone right on their ear and just put it on vibrate for a minute. Amen. And just let it vibrate on their face. It's it's a simple reminder to wake up. Amen. But no, I'm just joking. Okay. No, not really. <laughs> but anyway. Hallelujah. So when we look at this, the Bible says, if you have your Bibles with you, the Bible says, therefore, 
leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. So here, the, the, the writer of Hebrews is telling us to leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go backwards because I'm not leaving it. I'm going to go back to it because of the principles. Now, principles are the foundational stuff. Principles of the doctrine of Christ, not laying again the foundation. We're talking about principles and foundation. A person that is a principled person is a person that lives their life under certain guidelines and certain rules and certain, certain ways and methods. A person that's principled in the way they live their life is a person whose ideas and whose values do not change with emotion or with situation. A principled person is a person that you can rely on because you know that they will do the same thing they did today as they did 10 years ago. The, the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons, but we find that God is a respecter of principles. The Bible is fully filled with principles. It's filled with principles to help us live a principled life. There is a scripture in the book of Proverbs about a man who swears to his own hurt. Meaning, he, he, he would say, he would not lie even if his life depended on it. To save himself. He will not change anything to save himself. He will not do anything to alter who he is because this is who I am. This is how I live my life. This is what's going on. Man that lives by principles, you can trust them. Amen? Now, and the Bible says talk about foundation. Now, foundation is what a house is built on. Foundation is what uh, actually is your address. Your address is not the side of your house. It's not the size of your house. It's, it's based on the foundation of your house. The lot number and the foundation actually has your address. So that you can move the house the top, at the top of the foundation. You can move it to another place. You can take, you can take my, this building and put it in my house over there. And this building will now have 80 on it. And my house will now have 11 on it because the foundation is what the address is all about. The foundation is what helps you not be moved. It's the foundation. It helps you not to be blown by the wind. It is the foundation of this building that, that caused the building to stay here when Sandy rolled in. When the 12 foot, the 15 feet Waves came when the 15 foot waves came into the house, even though the houses was broken up, the foundation stood there. See, the Bible says, leaving the principles of Dr. God, let us go into perfection. There's no way for us to go into perfection, there's, there's no way for us to truly go into perfection without understanding our foundation. Because there are people that can live on the third floor. Right? And have it all furnished, but you know it's not going to last. The foundation is messed up. How many of you here have ever, um, or, or, or that wants to buy a house or ever bought a house, would ever buy a house that has a broken foundation? Raise your hand. If the inspector tells you, Brother Godfrey, the house that you're about to buy has a crack on its foundation, are you going to say, here's $300,000, give it to me? Right? The foundation has a crack, Godfrey, but the third floor has a really nice master suite. The foundation is cracked, but man, there is a nice tub, soaker tub, clawfoot tub in the master bathroom. The first floor is... Are, are, built, are a nicely wooden floors on the first floor. There is a sectional worth $3,000 on the first floor. There's a nice gourmet kitchen. You got 
top stainless steel appliances in, in, in your kitchen. There is a beautiful bathroom that you have. You got a spacious bedroom upstairs on the third floor. You got another spacious bedroom. You got another spacious bedroom. But the foundation is cracked. Now you'd probably say, well, that sounds like a good idea. Let me go and what? How much is it going to cost me to fix the foundation? Right? Because the foundation is where everything starts. Uh, there are people that know how to pray, that love to pray, that love to pray, and that love to worship, but have no foundation. They know how to worship God, but should something come up, they forget how to pray. They forget how to praise God. They can't even, they can't praise God anymore because they have no foundation underneath them. Because when the wind blows and the gales come and the sea swells up, if you're not founded, you're going to be moved from that foundation. How do you say amen? So Paul the apostle, or the writer of Hebrews, sets in order some of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Put up that, the, 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 uh, the slide for us, Brother Danny, if you can. The principal foundational teachings as a Christian. These are some of the things that as a Christian we ought to know. Foundational stuff. Turn to your neighbor and say foundation. Some of you just looking at this going, thank God, I finally, you've been waiting for it. I'm trying to figure it out. So the first one, if you have your Bibles with you, and you should, but the first one, the book of Hebrews chapter 6, let's, let's take a look at it. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. The first one is the foundation of repentance. The word repentance means to turn around. And I'm actually going to break down these, these six principles uh, in the next couple of weeks. And we're going to have some invited guests to come and talk about these, these things. So I want you to make, make sure you come. And, and make sure that you, you're, you have your notebook with you and are learning here. Amen. So repentance from dead works. Now, <clears throat> the first one, repentance from dead works, is actually can divide it into two areas. Okay. Repentance, number one, is repentance from sin. Repentance is going the opposite way. It's a 180 degree turn. Right? When you accepted Jesus in your life, amen, uh, what you said is that my way is not the best way. God's way is the best way. That's really what you're saying. I accept Jesus into my life. I no longer follow my way. I follow God's way. I follow God's way. There is this, the sin nature of man that constantly comes out and tells you your way is the right way. Your way is the right way. Amen. And some of us have followed it to our detriment. Have followed our way to our detriment. Repentant, this is going to be fantastic. Some of you, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to totally change your perspective because some of you still think your way is a good way. And that's the reason why you're not living fully for Christ. Because the Bible talks about renewing of the mind, right? Your mind is not yet renewed because you have not fully repented. Because there's a worldly system that flows in our lives. There's a societal system. There's a cultural system. There's a traditional system. There's a worldly system. There's a satanic system that flows. And, and if you are not founded in God, if you're not founded in Christ Jesus, you're going to think that that system is the right system because everybody's following that system. 
because the media says that system is good and because your friend says it's okay and because your neighbor says I'm doing the same thing you think well I should be doing it too but come to find out that God's way is not the way that is right in the man's eyes hallelujah and God's ways is different than our ways and if we follow God's ways you will find out that there are blessings to come incredible incredible gifts to come I'll show you what it is so there's repentance of sins and we're going to talk about that but then the Bible says repentance from dead works what does that mean well the thing is that Mike is that there are people now in the faith that have repented of their sins but now are 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 are, are hinging on their good works to get them saved so you've repented from sin but now you're so caught up in doing good, you think you're doing good is what's going to get you to heaven. So Paul the Apostle said, you got to repent from that too. Why is this important? This book of Hebrews was written to the Jewish brethren. And if you know your scripture just a little bit, the book of Acts, there was a portion of the Jews... That said, we got to go back. Get everybody circumcised. Get everybody doing this. We got to do these holidays. We got to do these stuff. We got to do these things. You know, let's go back. And the apostle said, you're nuts. So Paul writes, listen now. Paul writes the book of Hebrews to the Jewish brethren to let them know that they're saved by grace and by faith in Christ Jesus, not by the letter of the law, not by, not by working the works and the laws of Moses, but by fulfilling the law of Christ, which is the law of love and the law of grace. Listen, I know there's people that are, that are you know, that not, not too happy not will, will not be too happy when I mention this. It is a step back for you as a believer to begin to look like a Jewish person. Doing their holidays, uh, fulfilling their, their dietary laws. Uh, this may look good in the, in, in the outside. But Paul the Apostle says that's a step back. Because our, our hope is found in Christ Jesus. Not in what you've done and what you can't do and what you can't eat and what you have to celebrate. It's found in Christ. So Paul the Apostle, you got to repent from those works because they're dead. They don't do anything for you. There are two ways. So actually, Pastor Rolando is going to come and he's going to talk about dead works. He's going to talk about living by grace. Walking by grace. So number two is faith towards God. What, what builds our faith? Right? Well, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith towards God, and I, I want to just put it in here, is that faith towards God is really talking about our faith in the word of God. Because, listen, let's, let's be honest, the starting point of our faith, most of us, is not from the Bible. Most of us believe God, and we didn't even know where the book of Habakkuk was. Some of us still don't know where the book of Habakkuk is. All right? All right? Like, where is the book of Micah? It's somewhere there. Right? All right. So, most of us, if not all of us, our faith started outside of this book. But it cannot grow without this book. You expect to grow in your faith, you cannot do it by listening to worship music. You cannot grow your faith by going to Joel Austin's Manhattan visits. It's wonderful. It's nice. He's a good guy. You cannot grow it turning to the Word Network and watching it online. You grow it by loving this book. And it's studying the Word of God. 
Amen. Now there's an expression of your faith. What is the most, the greatest expression of faith for every believer is prayer. You didn't know that. The greatest expression of faith for a believer is prayer. Why is that? Because when you pray, you are declaring there is a God that hears you. When you pray, you're saying there's an active, listening God. Anybody pray? I, I'm learning how to pray, man. I'm learning how to pray. The book of Psalms is really helping me learn how to pray. Because my prayer sometimes, you know, is very like, Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. And if somebody did something bad to me, I'll just kind of leave it alone. God, forgive them. You know, if situation is happening in my life, I kind of suffer through silence, you know. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody here suffer through silence? You're thinking, well, I'm going to live by faith. So this situation happening here, I'm just going to suffer through silence because I believe God. When you read the book of Psalms, David was not suffering through silence. Anybody know what I'm talking about? David was like, many of them that rise up against me. Where is my help comes from? Where are you, oh God? Listen to me when I pray in the morning. David said, plead my cause, O oh Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. I'm reading this book and I'm like, my God, David, you're very vindictive, aren't you? <laughs> I'm reading the book of Psalms and it's telling me, get them, Jesus. Get them, God. Get them. Yes. <laughs> what? Repay the evil that they put on me. I'm like, Are you serious? <laughs> Have you read? You know, because a lot of people think David is just a praise guy. They think he's a praise guy. But David, depth of praise. Listen, listen now. Here it is. Here it is. You write this down. David's depth of praise was based on the depth of his prayer life. You cannot praise God. As greater as you can pray to God. So the first time David went up to the valley of Elah and killed his first giant. There were five giants. All right. The first one was killed by David. The, fourth, the, four, the other four ones were killed by his men. You see? There's some things that you are supposed to kill. And the other things you're supposed to let to live. Because other people are supposed to get them. Listen, leaders, right? There are giants in the church. I'm, all, I'm, only, so, uh, I'm only called to kill one. You're called to kill the other. So don't think. You're, you're looking at me going, you better kill him, Pastor Jones. No, you better kill it. Because you're not going to know your power until you stand up to the challenge. God bless you. Write that down. You will not know your power until you step up to the challenge. David, now 17 years old, Saul puts up an armor on him and he goes, no, I haven't tried it. Right? Several years later, here he is. He, he, he is, 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 his, uh, his, his men have been, have been taken out. His, uh, he had gone to war and had come back and all of his village and his, his, his town, his city had been taken out. His, the, the women, the, the children, the place was on fire. And the men talked of stoning David. Guess what he did? He didn't go. Well, I know back when I was 17 years old, you know, I killed my, I didn't have any experiences, but I'm experienced now. Get me my jacket. Get me my sword. Get me my armor. Come on, let's get him. No. He got up and he started talking to God. There's a portion of the scripture where David said, where's the ephod? Bring me the ephod. Bring me the symbol of prayer. 
Here's David, now a mighty man. He was not only mighty, he had three men that were mighty, and there were 30 other men. There were 30 men that were mighty, three men that were mightier than the 30, but the 30 was mightier than the 400. And guess what David didn't say? He didn't say, I know how to do this. I got men with me. Let's go and get them. No, he said, let me talk to God. See, some of us, we're experiencing God. We think we know what's up, and we don't need to talk to God anymore. Talk to yourself, Jones. Think you can preach without praying. You think you could lead worship without praying. You think you could usher without praying. You think you could come here and change the atmosphere without prayer. You've been doing it for 15 years. You've been doing it for 16 years, Pastor Jones. You've been doing that. You think you got it all good? No. There is a man that God is requiring him to talk to him and let him know, God, you're still what I need. God, I may no longer be in the valley of Elah. I may have defeated my giant, but God, you're still my God. God, I still lean on you. I still turn to you. I'm not supposed to be preaching right now. I'm just supposed to be exploring this stuff. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're talking to God. Or are you talking to yourself? Huh? Somebody say amen. Are we all here? So faith towards God, prayer and Bible, prayer and word. Here's number three, the doctrine of baptisms. Now it's interesting. Doctrine means teaching. Uh, so we got to be taught, right? <laughs> this is good because repentance comes from the Lord. Faith comes from God. Doctrine is a teaching. It comes from somebody sharing it with you. So there's a doctrine of baptism. What's the doctrine of baptisms? There are three baptisms that I find in the scripture. Number one is water baptism. Water baptism. Right, Philip? Who was someplace in the book of Acts? And an Ethiopian eunuch? In the house of the queen of Ethiopia? Was riding his chariot and he was reading a scripture. And the Holy Spirit told Philip, ride with that chariot and Philip said do you know what you're reading he's reading from the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and the eunuch said I got nobody to tell me what it means you need you need somebody to teach you okay so as they moved along the Bible says that the eunuch stops Philip where he was and he said there's water what hinders me to be baptized what we find from that, Brother Mike, and we're going to talk about it, but what we find from that is that the gospel of Jesus cannot be preached without the doctrine of baptism. Because the Bible said that Philip started from that scripture, Isaiah 53, and talked about Jesus. And nowhere else was it elaborated what Philip was telling the eunuch but the eunuch says, there's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Baptism is part of the Jesus message. Amen? What other baptisms? There's baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells in us in a magnificent way. And the Holy Spirit has two types of baptism. The whole baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire, fuego. Everybody say fuego. Oh, yay, hey, Boricuas. <laughs> Where you at? Qué bonito bandera. Right? <laughs> Baptism, baptism. There it goes. That's a Filipino. I was just, I was just, just trying to talk like a Boricua. Now I'm back to my Filipino self. Amen. The baptism of Holy Spirit. There are 
there, there is when the Holy Spirit moves on you. That the, now the Holy Spirit moves upon us and then He moves into us. When you receive Jesus in your life, the Holy Spirit moves around you. When you are seeking for His Spirit, the Holy Spirit moves in you. And there's an evidence of His movement in you. The supernatural will express Himself supernaturally. Well, you say, eh, we'll talk about that when we get there. Then, the doctrine of baptism, another S, is the Bible says, we renewed by the water, by the washing of the word of God. Do you know that every Sunday you have the opportunity to baptize all over again and be renewed all over again? Yes. By how? By the word of God. Yes. That's why even though we change the time at 10.30 a.m., some of you don't care what time the service is because you know that when you come in here in the morning and the whole world is following you, by the time you leave, you feel like you're in heaven again. Amen. You're dealing with demons and devils and people and all those other stuff during the week. By the time you come out from this building and the word of God is preached, you're like, oh, I can take the world all over again. Let's go. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. That's a renewing. That's why I wouldn't miss a service if I were you. In fact, I, I somewhat am you. We go to a vacation. Some people go on vacation and they forget about God altogether. You know, whatever it is, the top floor has the party room and they forget about God. <laughs> we go on vacation, man. We go to vacation sometimes in Puerto Rico. We love that place. We've got a timeshare there. In fact, we're selling it. I'm not selling it, but we're renting it. So there's, that's just a plug, just a plug. Amen. It's less, amen, August. Oh, no, I'm sure. All right, so we go there all the time. And, and, and I'll tell you what, there's never a time that we vacation there that we didn't go to a service. No matter if they're playing, ding, 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 and the pastor's going, in the palabra del Señor, de los Jesús. Hallelujah. I don't care what in the world they're saying. I'm praying, praising the Lord. I'm, I need to be in God's house, hearing God's word, even if it's in a different language. Praise the Lord. I need it. I need it. Somebody turn to your neighbor. I need God's word. Then the laying on of hands. Now, the Bible is awesome in its description of laying of hands. There is a power to the physical church. The physical church, though it's physical, though you and I are humans, uh, amen, the church is spiritual. And because our God is divine and he's holy and he's awesome and he's a spirit, there is power to the saints of God from him. The Bible says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Anybody sick among you, they should call for the elders of the church and the laying in of hands of the presbyter. Paul the apostle laid hands on Timothy. Laying hands is a transference of anointing. There's a laying in of hands. The Bible says lay hands on no man suddenly. You don't want to be partakers of whatever he's doing. That means you got to be prayed through before you pray up. It's with somebody. Somebody say Amen. Then the resurrection of the dead. And I got some more things to share with you, so I'm going to continue on. The resurrection of the dead, we're going to talk about that. There's a great hope. We had um, small groups last Wednesday, Bible study. Oh, my goodness. I'm telling you, it just changed my mind. You think about it. God spoke the world into existence. The universe was created. And yet we are, we, God chose this tiny little planet uh, in the galaxy, in the solar system that we're in to put man in there. And man messes up and God robes himself in the flesh and dies for us. And you think there are millions and billions and trillions of planets and stars all around the galaxy. Why in the world would the great God that created the heavens and the universe would come and save man and he only is there for 70 to 80 years? Why would God do such a thing? 
Because I believe when Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go prepare a place for you so that where I am there you may be also in the book of John chapter 14. This is what he's saying. This is my own interpretation of it. Please don't make this a doctrine. Just my thought about it. I believe the Father's house is the universe. And the mansions are going to be galaxies and planets. I believe that God created the whole world and came to save us so that we can enjoy the house of our Father. Amen. You, guys, you guys need to hear that when I preach it. You, you guys are going to love it. You're going to leave this place going, I'm living for Jesus. Ah. And then of eternal judgment. Now listen to this. There's the resurrection of the dead and then there's the eternal judgment. There's a teaching on what happens to believers but we also know what happens to non believers now listen the resurrection of the dead is very awesome because most religions base their doctrine on what happens after you die there's a doctrine of resurrection which we believe that when you die you're going to rise again either to life in Christ or to eternal judgment without him right there's also the doctrine of annihilation which just means that you and I are just going to when we die, we just cease to exist. And then there's the, the doctrine of the, what? Reincarnation, which means that if you die, depending on what you do, you could come back as a roach. <laughs> or a mouse. Or asparagus. Whatever it is. <clears throat> or somebody's mole on their face. That's the doctrine of reincarnation. Whatever you do is me. But most religions base their doctrines now that your end time life or after death you, is, is, is responsive to what you do in life. So if you're good here, you might reincarnate to something better. Okay? All right? Annihilation just means, well, neither good nor bad, you just die. And you just live according to your conscience, I guess. Whatever that is. However you live in your life. Right? Those are the same people that if people murdered you, they'd be like, well, they're just doing what they think is right for them. That's so dangerous. Do what's right for you. Well, I don't like my neighbors. I'm going to do what's right for me and bulldoze their house. Somebody actually did that. You heard about that one? The woman somewhere in, somewhere in Hicksville or somewhere in Hick County. Amen. Didn't like his neighbors, Raph. She didn't like her neighbors. The neighbors went on vacation. She hired a bulldozer and bulldozed their home. <laughs> neighbors come back like, where's my house? What are you doing? You're bulldozing. So she's in jail, you know. Yeah. Well, I got some more evil, wicked ones. I'm not going to share that with you all. But these are the same people that believe whatever happens in your life, it's just what you do now. No, 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 no. It's just That's a terrible thought, okay? But with Christianity, it's not, it's not what you do in this life necessarily it's what Jesus has done that's a great great thing okay so let's let's look at the next slide here let's look at the next thing that I want to share with you so the scripture tells us we got to be here in this principle foundational teachings now when you look at the book of Hebrews chapter 6 it gives you what you receive when you're founded this is what you receive when you're founded in Christ number one you go into perfection. That per word perfection is maturity. We talked about it last week. That some people want the milk of the word of God. Well when you're founded in God's word. You become mature in Christ. Things don't offend you the way they used to. You don't respond the way you used to. Because you found out the ways of God now. Somebody say amen. 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 That you are mature in Christ. Mature in Christ. Amen. We... We, 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 if we raise funds, you're not running out of the church going, ah! We're talking about maturity. Responding in a way that does not look like you're a child. 
told the apostle, says, when I was a child, I did childish things. But when I grew up, I became a man. Somebody say amen. amen. So you and I are going to get disagreements. You and I are going to have disagreements. Maturity will teach us how we respond to the disagreement. I was with a pastor the other day, uh, yesterday, and we believed in two different things. And he came to me and, and he, we spoke about it. Now, two, you, he and I were not seeing eye to eye, but we told each other, I told him, you don't have to do anything different, bro. You don't have to do anything different. I know where you're at. We're just going to love and work with each other. I could, I could, be, I could have different ideas from you. I could, I could even have a, a disagreement with you, but you and I can still be brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. So maturity, we, we go into maturity. Now, then the number two is when we are founded in God's word, we get enlightenment. Somebody say enlightenment. enlightenment. What is enlightenment? Enlightenment is seeing things or seeing ways or having thoughts that we've never seen before. Listen, I don't want to shock anybody here, but I want to tell you that when you're growing up, you, you were taught or you picked up certain ideologies and thinking that were inconsistent with what God says. When you're founded in God's word, you'll realize why God says why he said what he said. When you're founded in God's word, you'll realize why. For instance, let's say about fornication. Why it is good for a man to have one wife and the, wife, the, the woman to have one husband. That, why it's good. You, you, you'll understand that. Because in the world, it don't matter. Marriage is just what? Paper. For those of us that are enlightened, we see and understand it. We understand it. We understand why the need for church. We understand why the need the, uh, to, 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 to support the church financially. We, we understand why we need to gather together throughout the week. We understand it. We see it. We understand why we should not be angry. Why we should forgive. Why we should do all this stuff. Why we should not be worried about certain things. We understand. The things open up to us that we've never thought before. And I'm telling you, if you stay in God. See, that's, this is the issue, Brother Mike. is because they, people don't know the word of God. That's why they jet out of God's god's house when deep and heavy things are spoken from this pulpit amen they just leave because they have not yet been founded and they will not receive enlightenment they will not receive clarity in their mind some of us are so confused that in order for god to really move in your life you've got to sit down and buckle your seat belt and say i'm not moving no matter what happens no matter what the pastor preaches because you know what i'm going to say some things that are very offensive sometimes and it's going to sound like i'm trying to kill you and hurt you hallelujah but I'm telling you, I'm like the chiropractor, you know. You, oh, wait a minute. I feel better now. Don't say that. Oh, no, no. Oh. Oh. I told you about my experience over there at Times Square. I had my metacarpal, metacarpal, the carpal tunnel copper tunnel syndrome i had my little band bandage and and i was i was praising the lord and this this korean lady korean doctor comes to me and says what's going on here he said well i my wrist hurt and she said oh you got a copper tunnel look at it and then she pushes my hand backwards like this and she i'm like oh and she's massaging my elbow and my arm and uh, i'm like i hope you know what you're doing lady you crazy nut ah. She's praying as she's doing it. You love pastors praying for you, you know, preaching and going, hallelujah. Every time they say something sharp, they're going, praise the Lord. You're like, no, not praise the Lord. No, not praise the Lord. Oh. Right? And she's pushing on it and she's like, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, my faith. And finally, when she's done, look. I was like, wow. Nobody been there? Sometimes the word of God is going to cut you. And sometimes your brother is going to be used to grow you. You know, because sometimes, and not to be crude, but I will be. <laughs> sometimes you're the dog. And other times, 
in the fire hydrant. So, <laughs> you have your part in the world. Sometimes you're the offended, and sometimes you're the offensee. And you just say, praise God, hallelujah, thank you. We're enlightened, we see things. We're going to see stuff that we've never seen before. And look at this. When we're founded, we begin to taste the heavenly gifts. When we talk about laying of hands, we can taste the heavenly gifts. If you're founded in God's word, because you believe it, now you can go to the hospital because the word of God says they shall lay hands on the sick and, you shall re and they shall recover. So now you can go to the hospital and you're not going. What's Pastor Jones' number? Can I call Brother Joe? Is Vladimir around? No, you take your Bible with you like a good old Christian, put it under your armpit like we always used to do. I look like a preacher coming in. They say, are you a preacher? In the hospital? And you say, no, I'm their relative. <laughs> you sure look like a preacher. It says, because I'm founded in God's word. You go up to them and you look at your, your, all your relatives, they're crying and weeping. And you say, Guys, let's just pray. Wow. Where did that come from? Where did that come from, Omari? Oh, because I know the Bible says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. <laughs> you begin to taste the heavenly gifts of God. Who wants to see somebody through you, God, working a miracle in your family's life? I'm sure you don't want it to just be my story. You want it to be your story. You want it to be that, hey, just like Christina, who, hallelujah, who was supposed to be dead. We should have buried her months ago, but she's here alive and well. Why? Because God's word is true. His promises are yea and amen. And we've got to learn to stop. Darius, control me, man. I got to. Hallelujah. You can say you don't know my story, but I got a story because I've tasted the heavenly gifts. <laughs> Woo! Woo, relax, preacher man. We're going Jamaican too, bro. We can do everything. Man, my legs are weak right now. Ooh. I got many. <laughs> Yes sir. yes, sir. Is this all right? I'm having a good time. When you're founded now, hey, listen now. When you're founded, you become partakers of the Holy Spirit. When you have the Word of God inside of the Bible says, they that walk by the Spirit, they are. Wow, nobody knows. When you walk in the Spirit, you become the sons of God. So, we become partakers of the Holy Spirit. By, the, by us being founded in God's word, we become partakers of the Holy Spirit and we walk as sons of God. They don't walk in the flesh, are enemies of God, but they don't walk in the spirit, are the sons of God. So when we are founded in God's word, we become partakers of the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit now governs you and guides you. And now you can speak a word in due season and become a partaker of what the Holy Spirit is doing in this world and in the church. Because the, the Holy Spirit is talking to the church constantly. Unfortunately, most of us don't hear his, him, him speak. We have what they call selective hearing. We only hear the Spirit when it's a blessing time. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the Spirit sometimes tells you, go and talk to somebody. Hallelujah, I'm in the bus, Jesus. I don't know if you know, this is the B5, <laughs> whatever that is, the Brooklyn route number five. God, I'll talk to them, but we're in, we're in the Ford train. You know what I mean? <laughs> Lord, we're up in Queens, y'all. <laughs> you know, 
God will speak to you. You know, the best thing to do to allow the Holy Spirit to work inside of you, I want to challenge you believers, those of you that want to share the gospel. You go to a, a park someplace where all the guys are playing basketball or the girls are playing basketball, and, and you find the most difficult one. Oh, man, I don't want to talk to that person. Okay, I'm on my way. You talk to the most, you're at work, find the most difficult person to speak to. Oh, not my boss. Jesus, not him. Because I want him to go to hell. Yeah, I don't <laughs> But I'm going to love on him. And I'm going to press through. You become what? Partakers of the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit is trying to do here at the church. And what he's trying to do out in the world. Because the Holy Spirit is the active presence of, the, of Jesus here on earth. You know that, right? The Holy Spirit is the active present presence of Jesus here on earth. Without the Holy Spirit, Jesus would not be here. But because the Holy Spirit is inside of you, uh, you, you, you are able to walk. Now, uh, taste the good word of God. Listen, some of us don't enjoy reading our Bible. You know why? Because you have not yet been founded in God's word. You think it's just a book that's difficult to read. But when you get God's word, oh man, it tastes good. Nobody know what I'm talking about? Anybody have tasted the good word of God? Listen, I don't want to blow up Brother Darry. I said his name twice already. <clears throat> Brother Darry sends me all this, this good juicy stuff on Facebook. And it's not the juicy stuff y'all thinking about. Whatever that is. He sends me the book. He said, oh, man, God has just been moving away. Here's the book of Psalms. He sends me all 166 letter, 150 chapters, you know, whatever it is. He sends me a whole chapter. And he's like, wow, this is what God is doing. What God is it? And, and, and you see that there are people that love God's word. They're like, oh, man, oh, that's so good. <laughs> that's good. Right? It's like tasty bread. Corn in the cob, man. July 4th coming up. Oh, man, Father's Day coming up. Oh, it's like, it's like Kirkland hamburger. No, no, no. <laughs> Grade A meat. Oh, man, it, it's like filet mignon. It's like, it's, like, it's like arroz con gandules. You know what I'm saying? It's like oxtail. Really good, good stuff. It's, it's delicious. It tastes the good word of God. If you are not there yet, press on. Get to know God, and you will open up your Bible, and you will... One of these days, you just open up your Bible and you'll read, and Jesus fed the multitudes, and you'll just cry. <laughs> Mother's looking at you. Why are you crying, son? Because he fed the multitudes. <laughs> oh, my God. God's word. You got to get that. You got to get that. And taste the powers of the world to come. Now, the powers of the world to come is fantastic because you hear God's voice, God's word. You start feeling so supernatural. You're declaring things. You're walking around like you're a mighty mouse or something. You're like, you're like, you're like, you're like, you know, a, a, a superman or something. You're just declaring stuff that you have no understanding but what God is doing, but you're moving in the spirit and you're feeling the power and the unction and the almighty God moving inside of you. This is what happens when you're founded in God's word. Listen, quickly now, what happens when you fall away? Now, the Bible says, lest we fall away, what happens? Let's look at the next slide. What happens when we fall away? Brother Danny, you still with me? Brother, Brother Tahim? Amen? We fall away, not fall asleep now. Come on. <laughs> this is what happens now. If you fall away. Now, falling away is different than backsliding. Falling away is totally neglecting God's word. Falling away is not tripping over stuff and sinning. It's not just tripping. It's talking about falling away. This is what happens. It's impossible to renew again into repentance. Because the Bible is saying all this stuff is happening to you. If you fall away, man, what, what am I going to do with you? Number two, we crucify to ourselves the Son of God afresh. And we put Christ to an open shame. <laughs> Next slide, please. But if we stick to our foundation, this is what happened. There are better things for us. When you are founded in God's word, there are better things for you. Tap your neighbor and say, there are better things for me. Oh, my.
my God, there are better things for me. You know, Mike, you're going through some stuff, but you turn, you turn and you be like, I know there are better things after this. Amen. This is where your hope established. Because you know there are better things. Better things are coming. Yes. Better things are coming. I know I messed up, but better things are coming. Turn to your neighbor and say, better things are coming. Better things are coming. When you're founded in God's word, man, you don't care what happens. You know that what? Better things are coming. Better things are coming. Better things are coming. Our, our relationship may not be so great right now, but if I just continue being the man that God has called me to be, being the woman that God has called me to be, being founded in God's word, better things are coming for my family. Better things are coming for my household. Better things are coming for my relationship. Better things are coming for my finances. Better things are coming for my city. Better things are coming for my neighborhood. Better things are coming for my children and grandchildren and those that are far off. Better things, better things. Things, better things, better things, better things, better things. Oh, God. Hallelujah. That's why you'll see 40, 40 year old Christians, meaning 40 years in the Lord, and they look like they just started yesterday. Why? Because they're founded in God's Word, and they know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. To those who are called according to His purpose, in their spirit, they know better things are coming for me. What else happens when we stick to our foundations? We become recipient of those things that accompany salvation. Hallelujah. It's good to be saved. Yes. But because when you're saved, things come your way that accompany. The Bible says accompany. Accompany salvation. Joy. Peace, righteousness in the Holy Spirit, laughter, hallelujah, the peace that passes all understanding. We become recipients uh, of those things that accompany salvation. When you're saved, uh, hallelujah, the stuff you used to worry about, you don't worry about them as much. Uh, anxiousness, anxiety leaves you. These are the things uh, that God brings when you're saved. Uh, hallelujah, we become recipients. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a recipient. I'm a recipient, 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 God, I'm a recipient, hallelujah, I'm a recipient, Woo! Ah, ah. somebody said, somebody said, I'm not only going to heaven, but I'm going to have heaven here, hallelujah, I'm not only going to have life eternal, but I'm going to have life more abundantly here, because it accompany. Salvation. And look at this number three. God will not forget our work and labor of love. Woo! <laughs> My God. God will not forget you crossing over Brooklyn all the time. You crossing over into, uh, into Staten Island. You working. Uh, you praying. Uh, you, st uh, you, you stumbling through but still pressing on. God will not forget. Uh, man may forget. Uh, I may forget. Somebody else may forget. But God will not forget. God will not have amnesia. He's going to see your name and he's going to remember the work and the labor of love you put in. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not here. Nobody's here and you open the door and clean up. God will remember that. Hallelujah. Your brother has no money and you put, you take your pocket and you empty out whatever it is you have for them. God will not forget. Hallelujah. You're praying for your pastor. God will not forget. Hallelujah. You're praying for your father. You go over into the hospital and pray for the sick. God will not forget. God will not forget your work. 
sometimes we feel unappreciated by what we do but you don't don't you ever forget that God will not forget your labor of love and your work you continue working the works of God no matter if you get a pat on the back you know that God will not forget it God will not forget it God will not forget it listen Cornelius Cornelius was not a saved man but God set up a memorial for him in heaven he was not saved he did not have the name of Jesus and he had a memorial up in heaven I wonder what you have up in heaven is God building a memorial up for you is he building one up for you up in heaven hallelujah, hallelujah. look at this verse uh, not not verse 4 but lastly when we stick to our foundations we have full assurance of hope unto the end oh my god that means your hope will outlast no matter what's going on your hope will outlast not just assurance but full assurance concrete assurance unmovable assurance you're steadfast unmovable you're in there in there number five next slide please we will inherit the promise of God hallelujah number five come on we will inherit the promise of God promises of God to Abraham which he swore to himself blessings and multiplication listen when we're founded in God's word we will inherit the promises of God to Abraham because the Bible said he swore to himself and he could not lie Bible says he swore to no, to no other, because there's no one greater, he swore unto himself. This is a swear. This is a swear of God to himself. Because he could not swear to anybody else because he was greatest of all. Because he's greatest of all. God didn't say, I swear to Abraham, or I swear to Jacob, or I swear to Moses. No, he said, I swear to myself, I will bless you. I will multiply you. He swore to us. Oh my God. Can, can we look at that? I know we're running out of time and I'm preaching a lot longer than I normally try to. Is this all right? Look at this. It says here. See, this is verse 12, chapter 6. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself saying, surely, blessing I will bless you. And multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he, ob he obtained the promise. So the, 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 the thing is God is saying here is we will inherit the promise if we press on. Because you can bet your life on it. God's going to bless you. I want to tell you, Prudencio Almeida, my, my Lolo, my grandpa, my abuelo, and my grandma fasted and prayed. God blessed them. They moved them to America. Had children. Most of their children are here. Poor people back when Jesus found them. Pobre, mahirap, ansahit. Just poor people. You look at my relatives now, there's no trace of that pre previous life. There's no trace of that hardship. Why? Because God swore to himself. Yes, 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 yes. He swore to himself. I will bless you. <sighs> Hallelujah. Number six, receive strong consolation. You know what strong consolation is? When tough times are coming, there's something that tells you everything is going to be all right. Something that consoles you. People die and you hurt, but there's a consolation in your spirit. 
there is a reward. Ah, my God. And the number seven, this is the greatest promise, I think, of all of them. And you're founded in God's word. We are allowed to enter into the veil. What's that mean? The veil is in reference to the Old Testament structure known as the temple. The temple behind the veil was the very presence of God, known as the Ark of the Covenant. It was also known as the holiest of holies. When Jesus died, that veil was rent in half. Telling us that we could enter in. So what the Word of God is saying is when we're founded in His Word, we're allowed to enter into the presence of God. Because previously only one person was allowed to enter in. Now, because of Jesus Christ, we're allowed to enter boldly and through the throne room of grace and find favor in time. You don't know what you have until you understand what you're getting. We come to church every Sunday and we think it's religion as usual. We come to church every Sunday and we punch ourselves into it. This ain't religion. I saw something said yesterday. Religion is a man in church thinking about fishing. Relationship is a man fishing, thinking about God. Yes. You can't get me out. I would to God that you and I be founded in God's word. Because of all the things that are promised to us. I would to God that we be found in God's word. That you would spend your, your time studying the word of God. Calling on the name of Jesus. Getting yourself wrapped up in his love and his goodness. Your life will never be the same again. Your life will experience the greatest joy you've ever experienced. But the promise is not only for you, but it's for you and your family and to those that are called. Even to the furthest parts, the furthest that your family goes hallelujah my mom got to know the Lord when she was in her 20s fully know the Lord and now there's a church here in New York City think about that sometimes it's hard to think and conceptualize what will God do for you when it's just you but when you hear God's Word you will see that the promise is not just for you. Do you hold on, believer? You love God. I want us to stand to our feet.